Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see you again. I didn't expect to see you again so soon. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Cameron. Shame that's under uh, James being ill. Um, I think the great thing about being here so regularly now, though, is um, I'm going to master driving out of your driveway without scraping the bottom of my car. Because when you come once a year, you forget about that. But a few times in a month, I'm going to remember this time. How about I pray again as we look at God's word? Father, we do thank you for your word, that it is living and active, and we pray as we think through this passage, you will show us who Jesus is and strengthen our faith in him. And we pray for James as well, uh, that he will have a quick, speedy recovery. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, I think it's fair to say uh, that when it comes to those our world considers arrogant, Kanye West has got to be up there at the top. Uh, if you don't know who he is, by the way, he's a rapper, a music producer, uh, used to be married to Kim Kardashian. Uh, and if there was anyone in the world who loved themselves more than Kanye loves himself, I haven't heard of them yet. Uh, I was going through some quotes of his uh, recently, and uh, there's this classic, man, I'm the number one living and breathing rock star. I am Axl Rose, I am Jim Morrison, I am Jimi Hendrix. Or elsewhere, he said, I am Warhol, the number one most impactful artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh. Indeed, he thinks so highly of himself that he says, uh, I think I do myself a disservice by comparing myself to Steve Jobs and Walt Disney and, and human beings that we've seen before. I mean, who are these me human beings compared to the greatness that is Kanye, what have they achieved? I mean, after all, I liberate people with my mind, with my music, uh, minds with my music. That's more important than liberating a few people from apartheid or whatever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but the good thing about Kanye is he knows that he's not perfect. One of my biggest Achilles heels has been my ego. And if I, Kanye West, can remove my ego, I think there's hope for everyone. Uh, inspirationally humble man there. And, you know, it's, it's easy to laugh at um, such massive boasts, laugh at people uh, who say things like this. What I find really interesting, though, is that while uh, most of us would agree uh, that Kanye is at this kind of extreme end of the ego spectrum, people usually see Jesus at the very opposite end as this epitome of humility, the most humble, gracious, tolerant man to have ever existed. And yet the Jesus of history made some pretty massive claims about himself, about religion and about you and me, claims that would be seen as intolerant and condemned if said by anyone else. Claims that I don't think even Kanye would be crazy enough to make. And today, uh, we're going to look at some of those claims from that one small section of John's Gospel, one of the historical biographies of Jesus, uh, John chapter 14. Uh, we're going to look at uh, what Jesus teaches uh, in this passage about himself. And we're going to look at it uh, under three main headings. If you received a heading handout when you came in this morning, ignore that. That was James's from yesterday. Uh, we got the, I got the call um, around midday yesterday. It already gone to print. That's what we'll be looking at today. Uh, Jesus makes three big claims uh, that trusting him means we need not ever worry, uh, that he is the only way to God, and that he's going to continue to work uh, through us, in us, to accomplish even greater things. Uh, but before we jump into that, let me set the context, um, because you always got to set the context when you're looking at God's word. And uh, basically, our chapter occurs on the final night before Jesus is about to die. So we're literally uh, the Thursday night before Good Friday. And just moments earlier, minutes earlier, uh, Jesus, in a private meal with his disciples, has told them that he's leaving them. In fact, not just that he's leaving them, but that he's going to die and that all of them are going to abandon him. They're going to run away. In fact, one of them is even going to be the one who betrays him to death. And 
understandably at this point, uh, the disciples, they're freaking out. Uh, they, they love Jesus. They've left everything to follow Jesus. They've left their homes, their careers, their families. And now it's all over. Uh, it must have seemed like a bit of a letdown. So much for our long-awaited king and saviour. Uh, did we back the wrong guy? And so Jesus in our passage, he turns and he comforts them. At uh, the start of verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, we shouldn't lose sight of what's going on here, by the way. Jesus has just told them that he's about to die, that they are going to betray and abandon him, and yet he's the one comforting them. I know we're not super close. I know I'm a, a guest preacher here. But, you know, if I ever came here one day and announced, say, I, I don't know, um, I have, I'm, I'm dying of cancer, I've, I've only got a few days left to live uh, amid some sorrowful shock that I would hope that you might feel, I would hope most of all that your response would be to come and comfort me, to, to come alongside me and pray for me and ask me about my family and how you might support them. I shouldn't be the one up here comforting you, consoling you, I'm, I'm the one dying of cancer. That's, that's not how this relationship works. And yet the very opposite is happening here. The disciples should have been comforting Jesus, supporting him in the final 24 hours of his life. But no, they're freaking out and he's caring for them. We see here the amazing heart of Jesus. It's why. People think of him as being so humble and so caring. He truly does have an amazing love that, that even when he's about to die in the most difficult moment of his life, his concern isn't for himself, but for others. And instead of being troubled, Jesus tells them, you believe in God, believe also in me. And the word believe here, uh, it's the same word we often translate as trust. He's saying don't be afraid, just trust me. He's contrasting their fear with having faith in him. If you trust me, you need not be afraid. You need not worry. But why? Well, the reason is because of what Jesus says he is going to do, because of the hope he claims to offer uh, from verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus, he talks about the hope I can have eternally through him. He talks about his father's house, that is God's house, heaven. That's where he's going. Uh, and he says the reason that he's going there is to prepare a place for them there. And by that, he's not talking about as if he's, you know, up in heaven, getting things ready. You know, I've got to do the dusting. I've got to make the beds. You know, I've been down here for a while now, 33 odd years. Things have got a bit messy. You know, we're going to have some new guests. I've got to do some renovations, add some extensions. That, that's not what he means when he says, I'm making things ready for you there. No, no, what he's talking about is, is the very reason for his upcoming death. You see, his death is about opening the way there, enabling us to get there, because the way was not yet prepared. You see, the Bible teaches that there's a major barrier that prevents us from entering God's house. It's our sin. And by this, we aren't talking about just doing a few uh, naughty things here or there. By the word sin, the, the Bible's talking about our rejection of God. And it says it's something that we all do, that we're all guilty of us. All of us reject God, whether it's by living an outright life of uh, greed and selfishness, uh, whether it's by worshipping other gods uh, rather than a true and living God, or whether it's just 
you know, living a comfortable life in Sydney, you know, where we go to work and love our family and, you know, get on with life, but all the while ignoring the God of the universe who made us to know him and love him and be in relationship with him. This is a personal rejection of God. It's, a, it's an act of treason, really, that God can't simply ignore. He, he's a just God, a holy God. He must punish wrongdoing. It wouldn't be any more right of him to just sweep this under the rug than it would be for any judge in a court system to just pretend that crime and guilt didn't matter. And yet, at the same time, God is a God of love, of mercy, of forgiveness, who wants to be in a relationship with us. And so Jesus' death is about making a way for that to happen. In dying on the cross, Jesus is taking our place. He's taking the judgment that our rebellion deserves. He's taking the punishment on himself so that justice is done, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can enter God's home. His death opens the way for us to be right with God. And in light of this, Jesus is saying to his disciples, you have nothing to worry about. Don't be troubled because I'm preparing a place for you in heaven by dying for your sins. Now, it's not a promise they won't face any troubles in this life. Of course they will. In fact, they're going to face many more in the years to come. But rather, they needn't be troubled for God loves them. Jesus has died for them. And they have this amazing hope waiting for them, no matter what they face. And although Jesus was talking to the disciples who were specifically uh, upset about Jesus' impending death, the same logic applies to all of us in all our fears. When we're worried about something, uh, whether it's work or illness or school or even death, Jesus is saying, we don't have to be troubled. We can trust him, trust that he loves us, trust that he died for us, trust that no matter what happens to us in this life, that this is not all there is, that we have a home in God's house waiting for us. This is the first thing that Jesus claims about himself. This is what he says he offers to you and I. Now, it's a pretty big first claim to make, and it confuses Jesus' disciples, which brings us to the next section where Jesus makes even bigger claims. He ramps it up even more. I will read on from verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? The disciples, they're, they're confused, and Thomas voices their confusion. In verse 4, Jesus said, you know the way to the place that I'm going. Jesus, mate, we don't even know where you're going. So how can we know the way? They haven't got what Jesus means yet by talking about his father's house, about going to heaven. They're, they're, it's really confusing to them. So Jesus answers in verse six, I am the way and the truth and the life. In light of their confusion about how to get to heaven, he's like, don't worry, guys. You already know the way because you know me. I am the way to heaven. You get there through me because I've died for your sins, because I offer you forgiveness. I am the truth about God. If, if you want to know God and you want to know what God's like, you see it all in me. And I'm the source of life, your life now, but more significantly, eternal life. Everything revolves around me, Jesus is saying. Everything is dependent on me. You find it all in me. And so the disciples can relax. They haven't backed the wrong horse and there's not some additional work or insight or experience they need to get to heaven and be right with God. Jesus says, no, no, knowing me, trusting me, following me, me, that's all you need. But of course, while Jesus, what he says would have been of great comfort 
to the disciples, it's also a pretty extreme statement, isn't it? Because Jesus doesn't just claim to know the way to heaven and you can follow him on that journey. He says he is the way to heaven. He doesn't just know about the truth like some other spiritual leader might claim, but to be the truth. And eternal life isn't found in his teachings. It's found in him. He's the source. And even more than that, he says the exclusive source. They aren't found anywhere else. So how does he word it here? Not that he is a way, a truth, a life, just one of many valid options among all the religions of the world. He says he's the way, the truth, the life. It's an exclusive claim. It's a claim that rules out all other religions and worldviews. Jesus is saying that Buddhism is wrong. You won't find the truth about God there, that Islam is wrong. You won't find eternal life through it. Judaism, Hinduism, simply being a good person, none of that will be good enough. Jesus says, I'm the way. That's it. And in case we missed it, he adds two things to this. First, the end of verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. It says the only way to God is through Jesus. You can't get there any other way except through him because no other way ultimately deals with that problem of human sin. No other way takes away the judgment that we deserve. Uh, no matter how good we live from here on in, or how religious we are, and how much we try and what rituals we can do, we're still under God's wrath. Our sin hasn't been paid for. Jesus' death alone deals with that. And so it's through him alone that we can get to the Father. And secondly, he adds uh, that knowing him is actually what it means to know God. This is how we experience God. Uh, from verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Now, Back in verse 1, Jesus had already put trusting in himself alongside trusting in God as if they were equivalent. You know, you trust in God, well, trust also in me. But here Jesus doesn't hold back. He tells them that to know him is to know the Father, that, they, that the way to know God is to know Jesus. The way to have a relationship with God is to have a relationship with Christ. Now, Philip, he, he doesn't get it. They're still confused. And so he says, uh, we, we want you to show us God. Probably thinking, you know, uh, one of those majestic, you know, awe-inspiring uh, visions of God that the prophets in the Old Testament got. You know, can you rip off the roof and, you know, have God appear to us in this, you know, magical, you know, powerful, holy form? Then, then we'll believe. And you can hear the frustration in, in Jesus' reply. Don't you know me? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus here is, is claiming nothing short of being God, that he is God. And this is the reason, the other reason why he is the way, because he isn't a prophet, but he's God come in the flesh and this is the reason why he can be trusted because he's God come in the flesh he's not going to let you down he's not going to fail you or be found wanting in any way he's God come in the flesh he's a way that is completely reliable and basically put there are no bigger claims that you could make than this not even Kanye would be arrogant enough to claim to be God in the flesh, to be the only way 
to God and to claim that all other religions and paths and journeys are wrong. And this forces us then in the end to answer the question, who do we think Jesus is? Is he telling the truth or not? Because the magnitude of, of these claims, the, the greatness of these claims means we can't just dismiss him as a, as a prophet or a wise man or a great moral teacher. Uh, the great uh, Christian author C.S. Lewis, he put it well. We, we look at this quote about once a year up at the uni. I don't know if you look at it here, but it's always worth reading. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Basically, Lewis says, when it comes to Jesus' claims, there's only three choices. Because his claims, they're too big, they're too outrageous to dismiss him as merely a great teacher or a wise man, or a prophet. He claimed to be God come in the flesh, the one who all people should worship and follow, the one who's the only way. If he's wrong about that, and he knows it, well, he's a liar. He's evil. He's blasphemous. He's claiming to be God on earth when he knows he isn't. Or maybe he believes it honestly about himself, but he's wrong. Well, then he's a crazy person. People who walk around thinking that they're the God of the universe generally don't have it all together. Or he's telling the truth. Now, Lewis, he concluded that Jesus doesn't seem like a lunatic, nor does he seem like a liar. And so he was convinced that Jesus really is God. He really is the way, the truth, and the life, and he became a Christian. What decision will you make? What about you? Who do you think he is? That's what his words confront us with. And for those who are already convinced and are following Jesus as saviour, the application for this claim is quite simple. Just stick with him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Through his death, he's prepared a way to the Father's house where we'll spend all eternity. He has done it all. You haven't backed the wrong horse. So don't be troubled. Stick with him. But, you know, uh, as we stick with him, he actually leaves us all with a job to do, uh, which brings us to the final and probably most surprising of the big claims that Jesus makes about himself. And it's one that has to do with us specifically. Uh, we'll read on just the start of verse 12 to begin. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Uh, Jesus' expectation is that after his departure, that we will continue his work, that we will do the ministry he is doing. And by that, he means the work of bringing people to heaven, getting people into the Father's house. In other words, it's the ministry of preaching the gospel uh, and contributing to the spread of the gospel around the world. And notice he says this is a job for all believers because he says, whoever believes in me will do this. This isn't just the job for the apostles that he's leaving to them. It's not a job given just to the ministers and the evangelists or those who have been Christians for a really long time or the super spiritual or the super gifted or the super confident or, or those who've had all the right training. No, it's whoever believes in me. All Christians, plain and simple. 
Jesus is making this a normal part of the Christian life. A normal part of following Jesus is to share the love of Jesus, to help spread the gospel. Now, yes, some of us do it differently. Not all of us are going to become full-time paid church workers or, or leave our homes and go off to the mission field somewhere. All of us should be part of that work, whether we're on the front ground, you know, or whether we're behind the scenes giving and praying and encouraging. We're all part of that work. But wherever we go, wherever we are, we're all called to be part of this work. As a church, collectively praying, giving, inviting reaching out individually, praying for our neighbours, inviting them along to things, trying to have conversations with people at work. Jesus says, I'm, I'm leaving you here to keep doing my work. And amazingly, in verse 12, Jesus actually says, our ministry is going to be greater than his. Let me read it all again this time. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Do greater things than Jesus. I don't know about you. I haven't raised anyone from the dead recently. I haven't healed any paralyzed men. I haven't even turned water to wine, not even through one of those home winemaking kits. I don't even have that level of skill. What's Jesus talking about? What can he mean? Well, Jesus isn't talking about doing miracles, that we'll do greater miracles than him. As we've said, what he's talking about here is this ministry of leading people to heaven, of bringing people to God. and. Jesus is saying that we can do that in a way greater than him. Now, in one sense, obviously, we can't. You know, I can't die for the sins of the world. I can't pay to make someone right with God. I can't change someone's heart or anything like that. Uh, that's not what's going on. But there are a couple of ways in which our ministry now is even greater than Jesus' ministry on earth. First, simply we can reach more people. After all, Jesus' ministry was limited to only Judea. And by the time of his death, his followers numbered maybe a few hundred, if that. But since Christ has died, well, the gospel spread all around the world, hasn't it? To millions, to, to billions for a couple of thousand years. Here we are, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the planet. The scope of our ministry and the amount saved far exceeds anything uh, that Jesus accomplished in his life. That's part of what we're contributing to. But I think it's even more than that because of the final part of that verse there. Jesus says we will do even greater things than these because he is going to the Father, because he will die and rise and ascend to heaven. How does that affect our ministry? Well, it changes everything. It means that the news that we offer is fundamentally better than what Jesus was able to offer during his ministry, because we can now declare that it is already accomplished. You see, during the lifetime of Jesus, all his preaching, all the good news, all the hope that he offered was in anticipation of what he was going to do on the cross. But it hadn't yet been fulfilled. But once Jesus goes to the Father, everything has changed. Jesus has now died for sins. Jesus has now paid our penalty. Death has now been conquered. Jesus is reigning Seated at the right hand of the Father, the Spirit of God has been poured out and is convicting people as we go out there to preach the word. We can declare Jesus' saving work to people as finished and offer it to them as a gift in a way that no one, 
not even Jesus himself could declare because before then the way had not yet been prepared. What this means in a sense is if you're a Sunday school teacher, for instance, and you tell your, your tiny little kids in Sunday school, maybe in the creche room, that Jesus died for them to make them friends with God. You are preaching a far greater message than any of the most profound sermons that Jesus ever gave. Not because you're a better preacher. I'm, I'm pretty sure you aren't. But because you declare far greater news. We're going to do this great ministry. And in case this starts scaring you, uh, Jesus assures us that actually, really, it's going to be him that's accomplishing all this uh, from verse 13, our final verses. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, this is a verse that's a very easy uh, to misunderstand out of context. It's one of those verses that sounds like Jesus is saying, you know, I'm just going to give you anything you ask. If you ask me for a Ferrari, you can have a Ferrari. If you ask for someone to be cured, you're going to get cured. That's that's what I'm promising you here. Uh, and indeed, unfortunately, many Christians have misinterpreted this and taught all sorts of horrible errors uh, because of verses like this. But that's not what Jesus means because in the context, you've always got to go back to the context. Jesus is specifically talking about continuing his work, about preaching the gospel. So it it's, has nothing to do with whatever you ask God. It's only ministry related for a start. It's already narrowed down to that. And I don't think he's even saying anything you ask for about ministry, I will give you. You know, if you ask God to convert 50 people tomorrow because of your preaching, I'm going to convert 50 people tomorrow. Uh, if you want a million dollars for a new building in two days, you'll get a million dollars for a new building. That's, that's not what he's saying. You can ask God for those things. Might say yes, might say no. Rather, what I think Jesus is talking about here is about our role in continuing this work in preaching the gospel. As you go to continue my work and preach the gospel and love others, anything that you ask for me, I'm going to give. I'm going to help you. I will do it. I'm going to be the one working through you to give you boldness, to help you speak, to help you say the right things. Jesus is saying, as you go do this ministry, rely on me. Ask me to work through you. Ask me for boldness and love and patience, and I will help you. Get on with the job in prayerful dependence on me, telling everyone that I am the way and the truth and the life. Tell them how I died for them and how they can come to the Father through me. And through you, I'm going to accomplish even greater things. I'm going to use you to save the world. That's what Jesus has left us with now. How about we pray about that? Father, we do thank you for Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that through his death, we can be right with you, that we can have a certain hope of sins forgiven and know the place where we will dwell eternally. Thank you for this certain hope, Lord. We pray that we would trust in Jesus and stick with him. And we pray that we would get on with the job of sharing this news with others, that uh, you would use us to continue to save the world, that many more will come to know Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. And we pray it all in his name. Amen. Well, we're now going to stand and sing and express what we've just heard.